The Commonwealth is one of the largest organizations in the world, perhaps the third largest organization after the United Nations and the NAM also covers uh, 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 almost 20% of uh, the Earth's landmass and almost 2.4 billion people. With me is the Secretary General of uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, Ma'am, welcome to Vion and thanks for speaking to Vion from London. Uh, my first question to you is, uh, uh, we know that uh, the ongoing pandemic is something that is the biggest crisis the world is facing. How is the Commonwealth making sure that there is a strong response? We know the health ministers of uh, the Commonwealth had met uh, last week. Uh, so what was the, the basic outcome of that meeting as well? Well, what we know, and you're right, we have a 2.4 billion um, people in our Commonwealth, but it's really important to remember that 60% of that 2.4 billion are under the age of 30. So we have a young, vibrant population, not only full of genius and opportunity, but also needs in terms of employability. And what we have learned as a result of coming together, our 54 countries, is that we really need collaboration, coordination, in order to support us with some of these quite existential threats, which we are globally facing now, whether that's climate change or the pandemic. And so what our health ministers understand is this pandemic knows no border. It's no respecter of people or place or religion or economic position. And it has reached its tentacles into all of our homes, into all of our lives. And the only way, the only way we can respond effectively to this pandemic is by coming together in solidarity. And that is governments and civil society and countries and institutions. And that's what we in the Commonwealth are doing. And a manifestation of that was when we came together in uh, virtually it's the first virtual meeting of the World Health Assembly that we'd ever had. But in preparation of that World Health Assembly, we did what we always do in the Commonwealth. We held a Commonwealth Health Ministers meeting so we could talk amongst our members, the small ones, the large ones, the landlocked ones, the rich ones and the poor ones because in our family, we have always been determined to leave no one behind. So when our family of ministers came together, they were asking a number of very pertinent questions. The first is, what do we do? What are we all facing? What has been our experience? And then they were also saying, so how have each of us responded what has worked, what has not worked? What do we need in terms of medication, in terms of equipment, in terms of research and understanding? And they also asked and shared, and what do we have? Because our family works on the basis that if one of us has something, we are willing to share it with our brothers and sisters elsewhere. So if you look at our Commonwealth, health minister's statement. I believe it is an inspirational statement of warmth, solidarity, brotherhood, and a real understanding mm -hmm. that this pandemic will only be solved by multilateral, multifaceted, multidimensional cooperation. Mm -hmm. And that's what shines out of the Commonwealth. And I was so proud of the information given by every single one of our members mm -hmm. from Fiji in the Pacific, India in uh, Asia, but look at what Ghana and Nigeria and the UK and Australia and Canada, all of us, small island states in the Caribbean who've done such a fantastic job in keeping this virus at bay. So that collaboration was extraordinary. 
And there was a lot of applause for what India has done, the way that uh, Prime Minister Modi has led from the very beginning, calling to some together. I was coming to that point. Uh, uh, India is the largest member in terms of population size as well, in terms of size as well, when it comes to the Commonwealth. How do you see uh, what India is doing, India's containment uh, policy, how India is tackling this uh, pandemic? Well, I think and India has done an extraordinary job. If you look at um, when coronavirus attacked India, it was about the same time as uh, the coronavirus hit the United States. The United States has about 330 million people. India has 1.35 billion people. But look at what uh, Mr. Modi did. He followed the WHO guidelines really faithfully. That lockdown was so necessary because if you've got 1.3 five billion people, your most precious, most precious um, essence is your people. If you have health, you can have wealth. But if you have no health, if your people die, then how will they become healthy and wealthy? And so the putting people first, and this has been very difficult for India because uh, India is spending about $4.5 billion a day because of the lockdown. But India has put the lives of its people first. What is the consequence of the and the impact of what India has done? We have in India 107,819 cases, I believe, to date. But look at the ability India has had to reduce the level of deaths, 3,317. Each one a charity, um, a, a, a tragedy, each one really devastating for the family members. But look how comparatively speaking, those numbers have been contained. And we only have to look at the tragedy that is unfolding in other countries who have not had the opportunity to do that. But we've created a Commonwealth Coronavirus Tracker, which is updated every 24 hours. So we take the figures that were there last night and the figures will continue. But from last night's figures, we have 42,298 recoveries and every recovery for every family is a joy. So we have learned a lot from what India has done, how India has contained it, how India has tracked it, how India, who, as you know, is the largest producer of generic drugs in the world, how India has not only looked after her own population, but how she has reached out to others in the region, the assistance that has been given to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, but look at how India has reached out to the Seychelles and other small states, and the money that India has put into the India Fund, which is in the UN, and the fact that India has identified $50 million of that $150 million South-South Corporation for the Commonwealth. So that leadership role has been really important. And the fact that India has committed 10% of her GDP to the recovery and helping people who are suffering directly, I think that has been leadership and that's been inspirational. I think people are talking about that 10% amounting to about 256 billion US dollars, real money put into their hands of the people of India and 10% of that money going directly through the jam trinity. So you know that uh, Mr. Modi had, uh, and the policy had been to make sure that everybody had a bank account, everybody has access to an individual identifier, and that everybody has a mobile telephone who needs it. And that opportunity to make sure that money is getting directly into the hands of people who need it 
is so important, but particularly for women, mm -hmm. because we know that women are the ones who are still left to look after the family, to feed them, to care for them. And this opportunity to give women the money directly in their hands, on their phone, has made an extraordinary uh, difference, mm -hmm. remarkable difference mm -hmm. of re-enfranchising women, giving them independence. And I think that has probably been the single most effective thing that India has done to take millions of people out mm -hmm. of poverty. So I think it's been very impressive. People are watching. People are thankful. And the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Secretariat has been privileged to work very closely with India on a number of our um, objectives and a number well, of our programs. I'm working with India. Uh, as I said that India is one of the largest members, you talked about working with India. How do you see India's role when it comes to the the organization, the Commonwealth organization, how India can play a role, uh, how India's uh, case can be an example for other countries. So if you can talk about that as well. Well, I, as you know, um, so many people have been impressed by what India has done on ICT. Your uh, minister has been at the forefront of development of mobile apps and this interoperability between business and, and people and government, facilitating and uh, de uh, developing. So what uh, the Honorable Minister Ravi Prasad has done, I think has electrified uh, the other members of our Commonwealth family. I remember so clearly when um, the minister came to Sri Lanka for our law minister's meeting. And the passion he expressed as to how we should have access to justice to every single person in our Commonwealth and the aspiration that we were going to link innovation and opportunity and the way in which India is trying to deliver services at one dollar per person. Now, if you look at our poorer countries, our smaller countries, our developing countries, Many of them look to the developing nations and they fear that they cannot aspire to do or replicate what the, the developed countries have because of cost. But when they look at India and the fact that uh, India is developing these things because of her huge population, because she has 1.35 billion and she's developing these things at scale, and at a cost which looks accessible to so many, that brings hope. So I had a, a wonderful opportunity to come to India in January, talking to the ministers, talking to ITEC, talking to all of the um, elements. And I understood that India was really focusing on how she could help the small, the vulnerable, and the developing, and I very much welcome that. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much looking forward to India playing a much bigger role in terms of our provision of technical assistance to our member states, this, this transfer of information. And people have been very excited about the use of Jugah because this is how do you take uh, what you have and you turn it into something which is electrifying and successful by using innovation. So I think the work that we're doing with India on small and medium-sized businesses, the support that uh, India has given to the trade facility uh, mm -hmm. and opportunity, all of these things have been important. But through the uh, India Fund, in the UN, which has this $50 million window for Commonwealth countries, we have already been able to access help and support for Bahamas and Barbados, both of our small Caribbean nations. But there are other small states who are very anxious, particularly at this time when climate change is uh, such a threat to all of us. And, you know, it is heartbreaking to see what has just happened uh, 
in the last 24 hours as to the most terrible, frightening, biggest cyclone that has ever hit West Bengal. And to hear what is being said by the minister there that this is the worst cyclone to hit West Bengal in living history. And that the damage is apparently unthinkable and it's worse damage than the corona virus. Mm. And you know, in the Commonwealth, uh, we've been thinking about this, but when I was in India, we were talking about how do we face the existential threat that comes from climate? And we were working on that, but none of us were ready and none of us dreamt that at the same time as dealing with the existential threat of climate and the crisis that would come from that, we would simultaneously be dealing with a health pandemic which was equally lethal mm -hmm. in its um, parameters. So these two things are now going to create a financial challenge for all of us because you know uh, the Indian economy financial challenge uh, my last question to you is uh, Commonwealth is a huge organization uh, how has the pandemic impacted uh, its working we know the summit was cancelled also uh, there will be the after impact also of uh, the covid crisis the economic impact so how can the group work together to make sure that there is not a major impact. Nonetheless, we know that the world is in recession, but still the role played by uh, the Commonwealth. Well, what we discovered uh, um, in 2015 is that we have something very precious in the Commonwealth, which is the Commonwealth advantage. Because of our history, because we speak the same language, we have the same common law, we have the similar parliamentary system, similar institutions, that gives us an inbuilt 19% advantage when we come to trading with each other. It's faster, easier, cheaper to trade with a Commonwealth partner because of those similarities. But in addition, we identified that we trade 20% more with each other than we trade with anyone else. Now, that's something that we hadn't actually understood before. And up until last year, we had um, an opportunity to assess, well, how much do we trade now? We trade about $700 billion within the Commonwealth, but we haven't really invested in that trade. We haven't nurtured it, supported it. So what we are now doing is to see how we can really stimulate that. We hope that by 2030, that growth could grow to as much as $2 trillion. We also know that when we look back in history at the financial difficulty, the crisis we had in 2008, that the Commonwealth impact of us coming together was very beneficial. We also know that small and medium-sized businesses are incredibly important. And we know that we're going to go through a very difficult time in the next couple uh, of years, potentially. So we've come up in the Commonwealth with something we're calling Kulburi, which is bringing together our lawyers, looking at how we could come together and create a template which might ease the position. We are frightened that a number of our businesses will be threatened with insolvency because of what's happening now. We're worried about our regulatory uh, structure and what would be necessary to ease it. Well, a number of our member states do not have the sort of legal support that they need so that all the Commonwealth countries have been coming together to create Commonwealth frameworks, Commonwealth best practice, Commonwealth best practice contracts. And we're working really hard in the Secretariat to build those frameworks so that other people in our Commonwealth, if they need them, can use them. Many countries have the advantage of being able to do all of this themselves. But if we can pool the knowledge from those who have that knowledge and those who want that knowledge, we can make sure that no one is left behind. But there is the blue economy. There is the digital economy. We in the Commonwealth have been looking together with all our members on how we take advantage of that digital economy. And we've got a connectivity agenda. But we're also looking at how we can drive fintech because fintech 
is going to be one of those issues for tomorrow. But in addition, if we are really to address the existential crisis in climate, we are going to have to produce more resilient methods of adapting, of mitigating that crisis. And within that arena, there is opportunity for innovation and for change. And even the pandemic has seen our young people come forward with some brilliant ideas and innovations, which of course can be in the long term, one of the ways in which we make sure that the employability that we need is there. So if you go onto our website, which is thecommonwealth.org, you'll see so many of the things that we are putting together to restore our economies, to help to make us more resilient and come together in a multilateral way. And India has made a real contribution. And we have seen that the contribution that's been made by UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, Ghana, um, the Caribbean, the Pacific, all of us coming together, uh, Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Pacific, Europe, the power of that collaboration is second to none. And we in the Secretariat are trying to create a platform which will make that coordination easier. Just as we created a collaborative partnership, which we have called Common Sensing with UNITAR, with the British uh, Space Agency, the UK Space Agency, with Portsmouth University, ourselves and others in the private sector, so that we can use the satellite imagery, which was enabling us to identify that the terrible cyclone was on its way and reach out together to help with that. And we did that in the Pacific when Cyclone Harold hit there. And we are unfortunately readying ourselves because what the common sensing data has identified to us all was not only that the biggest cyclone that we've ever seen in history was heading its way to India, Bangladesh, and West Bengal. But that next, tragically, will be the region of my birth, because hurricanes look as if they're on their way to the Caribbean. That's our reality. And we're only going to be able to respond adequately if all of us, all 54 of us, continue to do what we have done for the last 70 years, and mm -hmm. that is stick together. And I really want to thank India for her leadership, her commitment, and her continuity. And I look forward to even closer partnership in years to come so that we really benefit the 2.4 billion people who we jointly serve. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, for speaking uh, to Vion uh, from London. And uh, stick together is something that is uh, the message which is required in today's world because of the COVID pandemic. And of course, the role played by India, the Indian leadership, especially when it comes to the Commonwealth, uh, uh, the role India could play in, uh, in the entire grouping. Thank you so much, ma'am.